project prioritization and selection methods, financial considerations, and weighted scoring models. Within an organization, there are going to be many opportunities. Opportunities to improve revenues, to improve operational efficiencies, to improve processes that address customer requirements, to respond to a competitor, and perhaps to address any regulatory requirements. However, every organization, regardless of the opportunities in front of it, is going to have limited resources. Those resources may be capital in nature, i.e. money, as each project will require some level of funding. We may not be able to do all of the work that we would like to do because of this constraint. We also may be limited in terms of the people available to execute the work. Time may also be against us, regardless of those opportunities in front of us and the value that they may bring to the organization, we're not gonna be able to do all of them in a given period of time. And finally, there also may be some limitations on the equipment and the materials that are available to us. All of this means that we have to have some way of looking at all of the opportunities in front of us and in some way prioritizing and then selecting based on those constraints. So an organization will have opportunities, i.e. potential projects, and it will rank those projects based on some given criteria. The criteria can be varied, but even though it is varied, and each project will be evaluated against that criteria, at the end of the day, those projects are going to be ranked from the project with the highest value all the way down to the project with the lowest value. And given our material, our capital funding or operational funding, availability of dollars and resources, the time that each project will take to complete, we are going to be able to look at that list and be able to draw a line somewhere. And anything above that line are projects that we can do and should do, we can do. And then there are going to be projects that we will not do or that we can't do, that are low in priority. That doesn't necessarily mean that these projects will not be given an opportunity to move forward. It's just that they are lower priority. And if things change, there might be projects on our list that were higher, that can no longer be completed, or maybe the market has changed, or some other condition has led us to reevaluate a particular project, and that one may come down the list and something will move up further. But for all intents and purposes, we are able to look at those opportunities in front of us and be able to determine which, which of those opportunities move towards projects and which of them still remain potential opportunities, but may and most likely not be able to be done within this current period. So how do we decide? How do we prioritize our opportunities? How do we determine which move on to projects, i.e. work that we decide to direct our resources, our time, our money, our material and equipment, and those that remain, for the moment, below our ability to execute on. So all organizations will have a strategic plan, a list of strategic goals, and it's important to be able to evaluate the opportunities against those strategic goals. How well does each project line up against that particular goal or maybe multiple goals? How does it enable the growth of revenue? How does it enable the growth of the organization? Things like market penetration. How does it potentially allow us to save money through operational efficiencies, and so on. 
The goals that are within this strategic plan become the criteria for scoring and prioritizing projects. And as I mentioned, there are going to be various prioritization criteria. And this list could be fairly exhaustive. One of the things that you need to take note of is that each organization has its own strategic goals and therefore is going to have its own unique prioritization criteria. Some of the common project prioritization criteria include things like strategic alignment. So again, how well does that particular opportunity align with our strategic objectives? What about project risk? Does it have significant risk? There could also be organizational risk here as well. Is this opportunity likely to have some sort of negative impact to our organization if unsuccessful? Or will it actually bring about a positive outcome, a risk that we should exploit? We can also look at projects from a technology fit. We can look at it from a resource availability perspective. We can look at it from a customer support point of view. And finally, for our purposes today, financial factors. At the end of the day, projects exist for a reason. Yes, many of them will have some sort of positive impact to the organization. Otherwise, we wouldn't consider these opportunities in the first place. However, not every single one of these opportunities is going to have the same financial outcomes. Organizations need to make sure that they're putting their money, their time, their resources against the opportunities that have the largest and greatest benefits for the organization against any costs, either to execute and do the project or to support it post implementation. And so we want to make sure that the projects have a strong financial return. The most important financial factors, i.e. criteria, when evaluating a particular opportunity are net present value, payback period, return on investment, also referred to as ROI, and an internal rate of return, or IRR. So let's look at these financial factors in a little bit more detail. But first, let's define some common terms. Outflows are costs. These are costs that are associated with the project itself, i.e. planning, developing, and implementing. And it could also be costs that are related to support that particular outcome, that result of the project over the course of the product lifecycle. Inflows are benefits. These are revenues, operational efficiencies, i.e. money saved. And when we look at projects, we have to be able to assess and estimate the potential costs or the outflows associated with that project and the benefits, i.e. any of the improved operational expenditures, the savings that might benefit the organization, or the increase of sales and revenues, profit. And this is done typically over a five-year period. We only estimate potential benefits and costs over a five-year period because anything beyond five years is considerably more ambiguous. It's difficult to anticipate and to make assumptions as to what the ongoing costs will be with any great certainty or the revenues beyond that five-year period. And so we have to look at projects as a multi-year investment. Next, consider the following. Because our projected estimates of costs and benefits are over a five-year period, it's not enough to just look at that particular value and assess this project or compare this project against another, against the third, against the fourth, by simply looking at the estimates 
over the five years as they are. We have to recognize that there is a time value associated with money. Money is worth more today than the same amount in the future. And this is due to its potential earning capacity. So, because we have cash flows, expenditures, or benefits flowing in different years, year one, year two, year three, year four, and beyond, in order for us to be able to accurately compare amounts that are flowing in different times, we must bring them to the same moment, i.e. today, by discounting the future amount. So what that means is, if we have $1,000 of projected revenue in year five, we have to recognize that it is not $1,000 in terms of today's dollars, in today's value. It's going to be something a bit less. And so we cannot compare, for example, two projects. One that has $1,000 in year four and another project that has $800 in year five. The same way, we have to take $1,000 from year four and bring it into today's value. And we have to take the $800 from year five and bring it to today's value and then compare. So let us compare first present value to future value. Present value is the current worth of future money, while future value is the value of a current asset at some specified time in the future. And we can convert one to the other. And so we can compare current or present values to some time in the future, or we can compare future dollars to the present. And we do it in the following way. Present value can be converted to future value by using something called compounding, which I believe most of us would be aware of, at least from an investment point of view, or you know, just simply our money growing, albeit slowly, in a savings account. Future value is converted to present value by discounting. Both of these boxes show the particular formula to convert, i.e. present value to future value or future value to present value. Our focus will be on present value. That is the practice of taking future values and converting them to present values. And that leads us to our first financial criteria or consideration, our first evaluation. And this is the present value formula. So let's look at the present value formula in a little bit more detail. Present value is calculated by taking the future value, the one that we want to convert into today's dollars, i.e. present value. And we multiply that by what we refer to as the discount factor. And the discount factor in this particular formula is calculated by one divided by one plus i, and here i is the discount rate, all to the power of n where n is the year in which the future value takes place. So for example, if we have a future value of $1,000, and this future value takes place in year five, then in this formula, we would use 1,000 as our future value variable. We would use the discount rate, and we haven't spoken about what that discount rate will be, but it is something that is unique to every organ organization. 
and is set by the organization. And we'll talk about that in a little bit more detail shortly. But going back to our example, because the future value of $1,000 took place in the year five, in our formula, we would substitute five for N. And this would allow us now to calculate the present value of $1,000, which took place in year five. So the discount rate. The discount rate is the rate used in discounting future cash flow. And it is determined within an organization and is unique to the organization itself. So as a project team, or for those that are calculating the various financial considerations of a particular project, it's not important to understand all of the elements that go into calculating and setting a discount rate for an organization. Other than to say that there are accountants within the organization that are tasked with looking at various factors that may affect the discount rate itself. The discount rate is fairly stable. It doesn't change too often, and it may change you know, once in several years or even longer. So a project team only needs to know what the discount rate is for the purposes of calculating things like net present value, return on investment, discounted payback period, and so on. For our purposes within this course in this lesson, in this lesson in particular, you will be provided with a discount rate. For assignments and for exams, that discount rate may change in order to change the calculation, but it's something that must be given. It is something that must be known. Otherwise, we cannot do our calculations. And so for the remainder of this particular discussion and this lecture itself, we'll see that we're going to have some examples that we're going to walk through. Let's assume that the discount rate is 8.5%. Let's look at our first application of net present value, our first example. What you will see here is an outlay of cash outflows and cash inflows for a particular project, estimated costs and benefits over a five-year period. The outcome of the project in and of itself is not important. Let's assume that the objective behind this particular project was to create some sort of widget, a general product, and in order to develop and to produce that particular widget, we've estimated that it will cost in resources, be it human and material, $1,000. This expenditure takes place in year zero. Projections indicate that once the product is available in market, we can expect a net positive return a benefit, a revenue of $200 in year one. Likewise, in year two, $400 in terms of revenue or cash inflow, revenue to the organization, 500 in year three, 550 in year four, and $600 in year five. Now, on the surface, if we look at this, it seems to be a fairly good investment. Spend $1,000, and we have over $2,000 in return over five years. However, if we recall, future value of dollars is a little bit less into today's dollars. So even though this is positive, we can't necessarily go by simply looking at those values, future values, and compare them against the $1,000 that we spent today. This project may still be and still have a positive return, but we have to assume it's going to be a little bit less 
when we convert future dollars, particularly those in year five of $600 into today's dollars. And so this is where net present value comes into play. Now, in order to do the calculations, I've set up a couple of spreadsheets and there is a second video that accompanies this particular example. And I would urge you to refer to that video to go through the calculations in detail. So what is important to note about net present value? First, net present value has to be greater than zero in order for the project to be considered favorable. If MPV is less than zero, this is not an attractive option. It is not an attractive project. The organization should not invest its efforts, its resources into pursuing this particular opportunity. Projects with the highest MPV are those that are the most attractive. And so when you have three opportunities in front of you and you've calculated the net present value, the MPV for each particular project, and if you only have the ability to do one of those projects and we're only looking at MPV as a single criteria for selecting, then the project we would select and should select is that one that has the highest MPV. MPV should also be calculated, as we've seen, over a five-year period. This is pretty much industry standard. Anything beyond year six, even if we have projections, even if this particular product is still viable and is still returning some positive revenue, some benefits, we can't necessarily and should not necessarily include those future revenues or those future flows of cash into our calculation because anything beyond year five becomes much more ambiguous, less understood. It's more prone to all kinds of happenings in the marketplace. It's just too difficult to predict and to have any degree of confidence about those cash flows beyond the five-year mark. Let's look at our next financial factor or factor used in determining the priority of a project. Discounted payback period. A discounted payback period is the time that it will take to recover the cost of a project using the discounted cash flows. Again, there are two types of payback. Sometimes organizations will use a very rudimentary payback calculation that does not take into consideration the discounted value of future values. It simply will look at how much do we spend today and based on positive returns, how long is it going to take to pay off that initial investment for that particular project? Now, one of the things to take note of is that longer payback periods are risky. Even though we do our calculation over a five-year period, like we did for net present value, projects that have a payback period that is four years time or five years time or even beyond are very risky because our projections are based on what we assume will be positive revenues or cash savings as a result of this particular project the outcome of that particular project, you have to consider that it's based on a lot of assumptions and things are likely to change. We can't be certain what will happen tomorrow and we're certainly going to be less certain of what will happen in one year's time and in two years time. So organizations want to recoup their investment as quickly as possible. So a guideline will vary from organization to organization. But a discounted payback period of less than three years is considered a good indicator. If you can demonstrate that this particular project and the outcome of this particular project will return its investment in less than three years, then we have some degree of confidence that the returns from that point on are going to yield positive 
returns. And anything greater than three years should not be considered unless there are other criteria factors that make it more favorable. There could be instances where a project has a very poor or very prolonged discounted payback period. However, and let's consider this, if the project is mandatory or needs to address some sort of regulatory requirement, it may take much longer than three years to recoup that investment, but the organization has no choice but to do that work. Or maybe the net present value is really high or the return on investment is particularly high. So there are other things to consider, but as a general rule, less than three, good. Anything greater than three, pause and consider other factors and whether they would make this project more attractive. So again, consider the same project that we saw a few slides ago. We're going to do a discounted payback calculation for this particular project. And for this, again, I will refer you to a video of an Excel file that demonstrates the calculation of the payback period for this project. The third financial factor used in determining project priority selection is something that we call return on investment or ROI. The ROI is determined by subtracting the discounted project costs from the discounted benefits and then dividing by the discounted costs. So for example, this is a very simple example, but consider the investment of $100 today. And in year one, without taking into a factor discount rates, that particular investment yields a $110 return. So in this case, the cost is 100, that's the initial investment, and the benefit is $110. This is our quote unquote revenue, our positive cash flow. And so to determine the ROI in this example, we would subtract 100 from 110. So for example, here, the 110 is again our benefit, 100 is our cost, and we divide that result, in this case $10, by the initial investment or the cost, which was $100. And so we have 10 divided by 100, which indicates that it is a 10% return on investment. So once again, we will use the previous example to demonstrate the calculation of the discounted ROI. The final financial factor that we will look at is rate of return or commonly referred to as internal rate of return, IRR. Many organizations have a minimum acceptable rate of return on an investment. The organization bases its required rate of return on what it could expect to receive elsewhere for an investment of comparable risk. The IRR is then found by determining for what discount rate the net present value will equal to zero. Now this calculation is much more complex. And for our purposes within this course, we're not gonna look at the math in detail. What I will demonstrate is the power of Excel and how you can quickly set up the project financials, i.e. the cash inflows and outflows for a particular project and use a function within Excel to quickly calculate what the IRR is. And again, as before, the higher the IRR, the better the opportunity. And so if we are selecting projects based solely on IRR, we will look at the project that has the highest value, the highest percent return. Let's refer to the same example 
as our previous three examples, and we will use the Excel function, IRR, to calculate the percentage of return, i.e. the internal rate of return for this particular project. Now, we've seen in detail four calculations that we can do for a project and based on the outcomes of those financial calculations, we will be able to determine whether that opportunity is a good opportunity and how good of an opportunity is it relative to other opportunities to help us prioritize. But what should be obvious is that we really don't select projects based on one of the financial criteria or even all four of the financial criteria. There are going to be other factors that organizations need to consider. Just because something has a great financial return, great financials, so to speak, it may be extremely risky or we may not have the ability to do that particular project at that point in time. Resources may be a factor. There also could be the project's ability on how it lines up with other strategic objectives within our organization. And so when it comes to selecting projects, again, prioritizing and selecting, we want a method that allows us to look at the project across many different factors. And organizations will use at its most simple sort of constitution, a weighted scoring model. A weighted scoring model is a tool that provides a systematic process for, le for selecting projects based on many criteria or multiple criteria. So how does that work? How do we create a weighted scoring model? What is a weighted scoring model? Well, a weighted scoring model, as we saw previously, is a way of considering multiple factors in our selection process or in our prioritization process. Those factors are established by the organization. And the term weighted implies that not all of those factors have the same value or the same priority, i.e. the same weight when it comes to selecting. Some, the organization will value more than others. And therefore, each of these factors won't contribute equally, but will contribute in some way relative to the other. And we use a weighting system. So we have to decide first and foremost what criteria are important to us. And then we have to decide on the relative importance of these criteria. And often it is a percentage of total 100%. So as we will see, we could have five criteria within our selection model. One of those criteria could be more important than all other four, and maybe it has a relative weighting of 40%. And then the other four factors share in the remaining 60%. And maybe of those remaining four factors, one is a little bit less than the first factor, in terms of its importance, but a little bit more than the other three remaining factors. And so of that 60%, it may take 20, thus leaving you know, a 40% remaining for the other three options or three criteria. Now, once we've established our factors that we use in our prioritization and selection methodology. And once we understand all of the, and set all of the relative weighting, then we create a scale for each one of those factors. So projects that align to factor A better than another might get a score of, if we're using a scoring system of one to 100, might get a score of 80 or 90 or even 100 because it lines up really well. It meets that factor based on you know, our evaluation. And the next factor 
will be also looked at in terms of scoring and how well each particular project aligns with that factor. And with this weighting and the evaluation of each project against that criteria, we can ultimately calculate a project score. And once we calculate the project score, we can select the project with the highest score of the multiple projects that we have in front of us, or we might be able to, if we can do more than one, select two of the highest projects and so on. So let's look at very quickly, just the generic weighted scoring model example. In this case, we will see that the organization is evaluating its projects across nine different criteria from market share effect and competition and risk to product fit and strategic plan alignment to customer support to MPV payback and ROI, i.e. the three financial considerations are three of the factors that go into selecting projects within this organization. And we can see based on the weighting, again, something that is established within the organization is unique to every organization. We will see that market share effect has a relative importance of 15%. It's not the most important criteria, but it's not the least important either. We will see that the most important criteria is MPV. That is something that the organization values above and beyond all of these other factors. Yes, they all matter, but in and of itself, it's the most important and it has a relative weighting of 20%. The two least are customer support and risk. All of these weightings must equal to 100. Now each project, and in this case we have four projects, project one was evaluated based on its impact to market share and it received the score of 80 out of 100, meaning that it really does have a significant impact to market share. It was evaluated based on how well it adheres to the competition factor, its MPV, its payback, and we can see here that its payback is actually quite strong, MPV a little bit less, at least you know project one relative to project two and project three and project four. And so all of these evaluations against this criteria are now multiplied out by the weight for each of the criteria. So for example, project one with a score of 80 on market share effect is multiplied by 15% and is given a score. Project one for competition with a score of 25 across that particular factor is multiplied by 10%, the relative weight, the importance of that particular factor. And then this continues on for the next risk and product fit, strategic plan alignment, customer support, MPV, in this case, 30, score of 30 times 20%. And all of these evaluations, all the way down to ROI, are then summed. And project one receives a score of 41. And we do the same for project two and project three and project four. We tally the scores. And in our example here, project four has the highest, 50.5. In some respects, it scores really, really well against some criteria and against some other criteria, not so well. But when we factor all of the criteria and the importance that the organization puts on that criteria, it does have the highest score. And so if we're only able to do one project, then we would select project four. If we're able to do two, it would be project two and project four. And so this is how now we can rank our projects as we saw early on in this presentation, project one, two, three, four, five, in terms of the highest value to the lowest value. And we draw that line between project two and project three. And so project one, in this case, project two, and project two, uh, in this case, project four, are the ones that move forward. And the other two projects, project one in our example and project three, are below the line. And therefore, 
either are on hold until or something changes or are just you know, put on hold indefinitely.